Hello and welcome to episode 34 of the Green Bean podcast. My name is Katie, this is Jack, and we're really glad that you're here. Welcome, a very warm welcome to my studio in Devon in the southwest of England. This is a podcast where I chat about my creative projects of all different kinds. And in this episode, I've got a bit of painting, a bit of knitting, and a little bit of sewing chat to share with you, as well as a lovely walk out on Dartmoor, which is the national park close to where we live. So settle in, I really hope you enjoy the episode. But before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of bits of news, um, things that I've been working on lately. I've been taking a quiet couple of weeks um, in terms of podcasting because I've been busy working away behind the scenes adding a few new products to my shop. I am um, Last year I did a design of newts, um, inspired by the newts that I see in one of my favourite swimming holes up on Dartmoor, um, and I turned that into like a repeating pattern and it's just sat there on my computer for a while, not doing very much. And I decided to um, to put some time into it and turn it into washi tape and stickers. So I'm really happy to have added those to my shop. I'm really pleased with how they came out. I did three um, different designs of washi tape. So one with newts and a couple with uh, like complementary pondweed designs and the stickers of um, include the newts and the pondweed as well. So I'm really, really pleased with how those turned out. It's been lovely to be able to add those to my shop. Also behind the scenes, I've still been working on kind of clearing out and tidying up my studio. And that means that I've added a few pieces of fabric and yarn and some patterns and books to my D-stash. It's all right, Jack, you're gonna stay. Good boy. Um, I have a separate shop on Etsy for D-stash items and as always I'll put the link down the bottom in case you want to have a browse at what I've got available both in my illustration shop and in my D-stash shop. Uh, so that's all for uh, information and announcements at the start of this episode so let's head out onto Dartmoor for a walk and then get stuck into this episode.
I've been going through a really weird stage with my art practice lately um, and it's kind of caught me off guard and taken me by surprise because I've become so used to the way that I work and you know painting, drawing, whatever it is and creating products for my shop over the last few years. I feel like it's come as a bit of a shock to find myself in a position where I'm struggling with making art. Um, and when I say I'm struggling, I mean on lots of different levels. I'm struggling to find the time to do it. And I'm struggling with the emotions that come up when I'm doing it about not being good enough and, you know, being really perfectionist about it. And of course, then that creates a cycle. It's the more I'm afraid of my art not being perfect, the more I'm afraid of making the art. So the less I do it and the less I do it. The, um, the more pressure piles up on when I do take the time to do it. And I think part of what's going on is that I have been trying to work quite a lot in gouache at the moment. So this mushroom painting that I shared with you in the last episode and this new painting that I've started are both in gouache. And I realised that I was approaching this as a medium that I'm very used to when in fact I haven't really used gouache since I was at art college, which is, I'm going to say I haven't counted, but it's at least 10 years ago. And even then I was using it in quite a different sort of mixed media approach rather than just painting with gouache. So in effect, I've been learning a new medium almost from scratch and I have not been treating it as such. You know, as I, I know that when I'm learning something new, I need to let go of any expectations and allow myself the time and space to be playful. And I have not been either of those things. I've been trying to create a finished thing. OK, my mushroom painting and this painting I'm doing now haven't been for any formal or particular purpose. They're not for a client. They're not for a deadline. But I have been trying to create a finished piece rather than just experimenting with techniques, throwing the paint around giving myself a bit more freedom. So there's definitely a lesson for me in there about needing to give myself a little bit more freedom and maybe being a bit kinder about it. And therefore, I'm sitting here recording a podcast and I'm going to show you a painting that I'm not entirely happy with how it's going. And that is a huge step out of my comfort zone. And I think it's really important that I do it because I've been feeling in a way kind of tied up and stuck by wanting to record and create a podcast and feeling like all of the art that I share on the podcast needs to be, you know, finished and perfect and in the process of becoming something tangible, something finished, something for my shop. You know what? I'm just going to not do that for a while, I think. I need to just give myself time and space to play. Um, and that said, I do have a painting on the table that is very much a work in progress. And as I say, I realised sort of halfway through doing it that I have been trying to turn it into a finished thing. So I'm in this weird halfway place with it where part of me feels like I like the composition and I want to turn it into a finished piece of work. And the other part of me feels like, let's just be playful with it and see what happens and not worry too much about the outcome. So what I'm doing is uh, exploring the tension between those two different parts of me and seeing what happens with this painting. Who knows? I might hate it. I might love it. But um, I'm certainly trying as best as I can to take off the pressure of expecting it to be a perfect and finished thing and focus on enjoying the process and and learning about what these paints do and the different qualities and techniques that I can use with them because that's really what this this time and this project needs to be about. Even as I'm sitting here recording this, I'm worrying that, um, well, certainly a part of me is worrying that it's going to come across like 
I'm, I don't know, looking for compliments about my painting or that's like, oh, it's all right for Katie to say that um, painting is a struggle or making art is hard, but Katie's really good at making art and that's kind of not what I'm getting at, I guess. I, I understand that I come across and seem like I'm a professional and I know what I'm doing because I I get to make my art for a living and I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do that. But I think what I'm trying to get across in sharing this honestly and this vulnerably about when things are difficult is that it doesn't go away just because you start working as a professional or getting to call yourself an illustrator, I always thought that there, that I would reach a point of confidence in my work where these doubts and struggles that I had would just slip away and I wouldn't have these anxieties about my work anymore. And I certainly have not reached that point yet. So I'm sharing this simply because I know that it's something that I imagine about other artists when I see uh, when I see them creating work, I don't know, more frequently, more consistently than I do, especially in this internet world of social media where we only see one tiny chink of a person's life and not the full reality. It's easy to imagine that everyone finds making art easier than I find making art and I'm sure that that is not the case, that it is, it's tricky for everyone and I guess the reason that I'm choosing to share this vulnerable stuff about it is that I know it can stop people from making art, it stops me from making art a lot of the time. And I don't know, maybe somebody hearing that I, as a quote unquote professional artist struggling with this, maybe it it makes it easier to know that they're struggling with it too, I guess. that. That makes sense in my head. I hope it makes sense um, when you listen to it. If not, I hope you're just enjoying watching me work on this painting and you probably don't think it's as awful as I do. And that's the amazing thing is that we all look at art and creativity differently and just because I'm perceiving it as a struggle doesn't lessen the impact that it might have on you looking at it. So. Yeah, whether or not you've enjoyed hearing me rant about how difficult I'm finding this, I do hope that you're enjoying watching me make it. So the painting I'm doing is of, well, it's inspired by the buddleia bush that we have in our garden, which has been visited by a fair few butterflies lately. We get um, quite a lot of migrant red admirals around here, but particularly this week I've noticed several peacock butterflies and I don't know, there's something about the colours in their wings that that picks up the colours of the buddleyad. So peacocks are mostly kind of red with big eye markings, but around the eyes there's this tiny little bit of purple and that really kind of it becomes really vivid and vibrant um, when they sit on the buddleia flowers, which are bright purple. So I really loved that juxtaposition of the colours, so that inspired me to have a little go. And I created this composition in my sketchbook, just like a, a tiny three panel comic, I guess, of watching some peacock butterflies approach the bush and then land and then seeing them just fold out their wings. They're so, so beautiful. So um, yeah, it's just a, a simple piece, I guess, that I've been playing with, trying to, trying to ease up on myself in the process and let the painting unfold and not worry too much about how it's going to look.
I've got two bits of knitting good news to share with you in this episode. And the first of those is that I have a second sock on my needles. Now, if you remember, if you watched the previous episode, I borrowed these needles to knit some um, extra pocket samples for my Scruffs cardigan, having only finished one sock out of the pair of this project. So I'm very happy to report that when I did finish those extra pockets, I am... Um, I put the needles back and cast on the second sock for this project. Thank goodness for that. I don't know about you, but I find if I don't start the second sock immediately, then um, then a second sock doesn't happen. So I'm feeling very good about myself that I've got this second sock on the needles. Um, and just briefly, if you haven't seen this project before, I am using, let's just pick them up and show you three colours of Killen Sock Yarn. That's a Blue Faced Leicester and Mohair blend from Black Isle Yarns. So it's a no nylon sock yarn and they've all been dyed with plants. Um, I've got two purples and a green. Um, the purple, one of the colours I had left over from my Cockle Socks project, which was a design I did a couple of years ago, and the green and the other purple were just sitting next to it in one of my stash boxes and I thought oh they'd look really quite nice as a stripe together. Uh, so I cast the first one on a couple of months ago, I think you'll have seen it a few episodes back, finished the first sock and um, now slowly but surely cracking on with the second. And it's just my standard um, top-down sock recipe. I don't have a pattern that I follow for this. I just kind of have done it so many times that I don't really have to think about it anymore. So it's got a two by two rib at the top, plain stockinette leg, a slip stitch heel flap and gusset, and then um, a technique called a barn toe, which I learned from Kate Atherley. She covers it on a blog post if you just Google barn toe. It's a really nice way of finishing a toe that doesn't involve any grafting, which I appreciate because I do not like grafting the toes of socks one tiny little bit. It was actually learning this technique that turned me from somebody who hates knitting socks to somebody who loves knitting socks. So that was a real game changer for me, was learning that I didn't have to graft those toes together. So it's just my basic sock. Normally, um, if I'm using a standard sock yarn, I do 72 stitches on two millimeter needles. But in this case, the yarn is a little bit thicker. So I've actually done 56 stitches on two and a half millimeter needles. So it really does feel like when I, when I do sit down and work on it, it flies by quite quickly. But of course, me being me, I've got about 15 other projects on my needles at the same time. So this is not the only thing that I'm working on. Which brings me on to my second bit of knitting good news that I wanted to share in this episode. And that is a finished project. I've got it right here. It's a test knit that I did. It's called the Caper Vest by Francesca Hughes. And I very recently cast off and finished this project and I am so, so pleased with it. Um, I used all yarns from my stash. Unsurprisingly, I didn't have much trouble picking out eight different shades of green. They're all Jameson's of Shetland Spindrift, which is a woolen spun four ply that's just the most perfect yarn for knitting stranded colour work. And I, I did a mixture of following the chart colours as Francesca recommended. So although it's not in the original colours of the design, I actually recoloured the chart with my different shades of green. And I began by following the sequence of colours. Um, but after a point, I um, I wasn't happy with how the contrast was matching up. So I started just kind of making it up as I went along. Not, not the charts themselves, obviously, I was following the pattern for that, but the arrangement of colours in them it was a little bit more 
uh, free and open to my interpretation than it was in the pattern. The other thing that I did change from the pattern is this crew neck. The pattern is for a v-neck but I find that I just wear things with a, a high round neck much more often and more easily than a v-neck so I went with a crew neck. But that is it. The only change I made, which feels like some kind of miracle. I don't normally do what I'm told as well as that. So I'm really, 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 really pleased with this vest. I think I'm going to get a lot of wear out of it. I've not had a knitted vest before, so it's a, like a new garment to figure out how it'll fit into my wardrobe. And I do think I probably need to sew a few more shirts to go with it. but that's not necessarily going to be a problem. I've just realised as I'm knitting these that there's definitely emerging a colour theme in this episode. The, um, the green and the purple has quite a lot in common with the painting I was showing you earlier, um, which is entirely by accident. I didn't plan that at all. But while I'm knitting these, I thought I would briefly show you that I'm not um, cutting the yarn and weaving in all the ends when I'm changing colours for the stripes. I'm just carrying the yarn down the inside of the sock. So you can see on this finished one here, there's a little line of yarn that's been carried from row to row. And I am finding it in a way slightly fiddly having three balls of yarn attached to my work. But I think I'm going to thank myself when it comes to the end and not having all of those ends to weave in.
So I'm sitting slightly uncomfortably here because somebody has decided that they need to share my chair while I talk about my sewing. Um, and I'm going to talk about underwear in this sewing section because much like with my artwork, I have kind of lost my sewing mojo, if you like, at the moment. I'm, I've been feeling a bit stuck and uninspired, even though I've got several projects on the go, as usual. Um, what I do quite often when I feel stuck with my sewing is I revert to the stash of projects that I have pre-cut out. So quite often when I'm cutting out a sewing project, I've got the table nice and clear and I've got all my pattern pieces out, particularly if it's a pattern that I am familiar with and I know and love, I will cut several versions in a batch and then fold those pieces away and keep them for a day like today when I feel like I want to be sewing and I want to finish something quickly and I don't want to go through the whole fitting process of trying something new. I just want to make a thing. And having those pieces prepped and ready means that it is possible for me to sit down and make a thing in a day. And today I've been making underwear. Um, let me grab a finished pair to show you. So I've been making these knickers and this is a pattern based on the Ava panties, which is a high-waisted knicker by O Lulu Patterns. But it's quite significantly changed from the original. And I thought, seeing as I've made another pair of knickers with bees on, I would pull out the original pair, the very first pair that I made, which also happen to have bees on. They look a bit um, shabby because they've been through the wash a few times, but they are clean. Um, and I just thought I'd talk you through the modifications I've made to the pattern because this version is made exactly as the pattern suggests. And this version is my perfect underwear. And I've kind of gone through various drafts and stages to make them, to get them just right for me. So the first thing that's changed is I have taken an inch off the waist. So I'm not sure how easily you'll be able to see. The original pattern is a little bit more high waisted and my new version is just sits ever so slightly lower. So the original version sits on my belly button and this version sits an inch or so below my belly button, which I find more comfortable. Um, the second modification I've made is to the gusset. Um, and this is something that I've always found, whether they've been underwear that I've purchased from a shop or underwear that I've made from a pattern, the placement and size of the gusset just makes no sense. And without speculating too much about what's going on in my underwear, I can't imagine that I'm that unusual down there. And so I can't be the only person that finds these gussets ridiculously uncomfortable. Just the placement of the seam, or in the case of the Ava panties, there isn't even a seam. There's just this flappy bit of fabric, which is like hollow for no reason that I understand. But the placement of this is mega uncomfortable. So what I've done with my adaptation is extended that gusset up so it comes a little bit more up the front and uh, I made this semicircle shape just so that I didn't have to try and stitch a straight line right across the front and I actually stitched the gusset down rather than having that hollow pocket for purposes that I have no idea what they're for so I just stitched this down it does mean that there's a little bit of a, a stitching line visible on the front of the underwear I don't really care about that too much um, yeah, it's just like a half moon shape at the front. I think it looks fine. It's certainly much more comfortable and that's the most important thing. Um, so that's it. Those are my major two adaptations to these knickers. And I've sewn them all just on my standard sewing machine. So not with an overlocker, although I did use an overlocker for the original pair. I just felt like it was too much faff and not really necessary. Everything is done with a zigzag stitch. Um, and the thing that I love about this pattern is the use of fold over elastic. So I've done a bit of a blue peter here. 
I'm not sure if you'll all remember Blue Peter, but it was uh, definitely one of my favourite shows when I was growing up. And they always used to have their craft projects at different stages of completion. So they would all bring them out and say, here's one I made earlier. I've got three pairs of knickers here in various stages of completion. So here's a pair without the elastic attached yet. And you can see they look quite a lot bigger before the elastic goes on. The elastic kind of gathers them in. So all I've done is uh, sew the gusset in and I find I've now taken some photos and saved them to reference for myself the particular arrangement of pattern pieces when you um, when you assemble the gusset because even though I've made this pattern multiple times, like 10 or 12 times, I still can never quite remember which order to put the sandwich together in. So I've now made a reference for myself so I can put that together quickly. So you pop the gusset in, then I sew my little half moon gusset adaptation and then stitch up the sides. And the bit that takes the most time, the, the only bit of the project that I find tedious, to be honest, is pinning on the fold over elastic. So here's a pair that I've got pinned and ready to sew. And I love how they kind of look a little bit like bloomers at this stage. They're all kind of baggy. Um, and obviously you can see in the finished pair that the elastic gets a little bit stretched out and um, they look a bit more like an ordinary pair of knickers by that point. And getting used to the fold over elastic has been a bit of a learning process. I've realised that there are different, um, what should we say, there are different qualities of fold over elastic and I've tried a few versions that I um, haven't got on with, including this one that I used on the first pair, which is slightly narrower and it's kind of hard. So if you sew it too tight, or even if you don't sew it too tight, it kind of digs in and is uncomfortable. So now I've found a folder of elastic that I really like um, and can reliably source. And that's from lovely Amy at Craft and Thrift. She has a lovely Etsy shop where she sells recycled, like, um, dead stock fabrics and um, she also sells fold over elastic in a, a range of different colours so I really yeah I'm, I'm really happy to have found a reliable source of elastic that is soft and comfortable to wear because it's been a bit of trial and error to um, to get to that point so that's it I am um, I now have my perfect knicker pattern and I've made well by the time I pin the elastic onto this pair and sew them together. I'll have made three pairs in a day and that's three pairs out of one half meter of jersey fabric as well. So it works out pretty good value and um, yeah, it's a nice productive feeling to pull out some of those pattern pieces that I'd already pre-cut and turn them into a finished thing that I can put into my wardrobe and start using straight away.
thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Green Bean Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about what I've been up to and seeing what Jack and I have been up to out on Dartmoor. If you would like to support the podcast and get access to extra episodes as well as all the episodes without advertising, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Katie Greenbean. And if you'd like to catch me between now and the next episode, the best place to do that is on Instagram, also at Katie Greenbean. That's all for now. Thank you for watching and I will see you very soon. Take care. Bye.